basically, I've been involved with the uh, laser in podiatry for about 30 years, um, starting with the CO2 laser back in the mid-80s uh, through an organization called the International Society of Podiatric Laser Surgeons. Um, and there was more urban myths about uh, lasers in podiatry than anything. Uh, at that time, we were using, uh, uh, I was not, but a lot of practitioners were using the CO2 laser to ablate a nail plate that was mycotic. And many of these gentlemen, their, their office kind of, uh, as though they were in the middle of, of uh, performing this because they didn't even know at that time about uh, vacuuming out the, uh, picking up the smoke plume. It looked like something out of a Sherlock Holmes movie, like the Scottish Moors with this cl uh, cloud of mycotic dust. Um, and it, di it didn't work very well. I've gone through uh, uh, other uh, therapies, uh, forms of NDAG lasers, where the uh, protocol was just ridiculous, it didn't work either. So I kind of given up on it until I uh, came in contact with this. And this is, this is revolutionized treatment of mycotic nails in my office. So, and I've basically, uh, using the laser treatment of onychomycosis using the 650 microsecond ND AG laser, 1064 laser. Let's see if this works. Should I push the button over here? Yeah. The button. Page. Lower left button. Lower left. Now, this is, these are old figures. Uh, since this time, we've done about 100 more cases, but there's been 200 patients treated over a 14-month <coughs> period. Uh, one of the important things to remember when you're treating mycotic nails is you're treating a, a patient. This is not a nail salon. There are problems that come attached with the patient, and especially in the foot since it's the area that bears all the body's weight and is encased in a, in a shoe. Structure is important. Uh, does the patient have a bunion? Is the big toe rotated? Does the patient have hammer toes, which means that they're walking in the tips of their toes, being a living tar out of the distal nail tips? Does the patient have diabetes? Does the patient have poor circulation? Does the patient have hormonal, have hormonal problems? All these things add in. So you have to do a workup. Many times uh, with Groupon and other, other uh, things out there with the, uh, this type of laser, people call up and they just want to come in directly for that. The other thing has to be done is, is and I, which I tell you is, is right now, is that as far as I'm concerned, the uh, NDAG laser only works for, on nails for treating and killing the fungus. If you, it will not work to reduce thickening the nail. The panelists may have some different information <coughs> than I do, but that's what I got. If the thickening and yellowing and discoloration of the nails is due to the reaction to the fungus, it'll be cured. If not, it's due to something else. And so you can't overpromise, but you can promise you will get rid of the fungus. Um, all the patients we, we, that we worked on tested positive for fungal toenails. I do three separate tests. I do the PAS, the KOH, and the microscopic. I tell the patients we'll get the results back for the initial one between 48 to 72 hours. I don't care what type of mycosis it is. As long as it's mycotic, we'll treat it. Um, and sometimes you'll get fooled. As I said, I have a patient now who's a um, UN representative for one of the African countries, and I would have bet dollars of donuts that she had a fungus and nails were thickened and friable and, and yellow, came back negative, all tests, because the, the KOH test and PAS sometimes take six weeks, so patients have to realize that. In the meantime, they said, this is the time when I'll do the workup, and what I usually do with these patients is I'll work them up, I'll take x-rays, and I will also do non-invasive vascular testing in the office to make sure there's not a vascular issue. So basically, we'll run duplex Doppler arteriography to check to make sure that there's circulation that's getting to the ankle, and we'll run digital plethysmography to make sure there's adequate circulation getting to the toes. Because that, if that, either one of those are a problem, then by treating the nails, you're just basically going to be spitting into the ocean. You have this bigger fish to fry here. Um, basically, the parameters are 650 microsecond pulse five millimeter spot size, first pass, second pass with, uh, uh, with the two millimeter. I hit all 10 toes. My assumption is, is that if one toenail is infected, they are all infected. It may be subclinical. You may not see anything on these nails, but you have to treat it. You just can't treat the nail that you think is, is, is infected. Um, and basically, when we, we do this is we do this 
Um, I, I'm a big believer because the two millimeters uh, uh, lens is a, packs a real punch. So basically what we use, we use a device, and it's, I'll give a plug here, it's a, the, it's a company called New Life. They make a device for anti-DVT. It it's, goes right over the foot, provides compression and coolness, and it'll cool the foot down to 43 degrees Fahrenheit with all the uh, international people here. I'm not sure how to convert that to centigrade, but somebody can do that for me. Um, and basically, we use it for about 10 minutes. It chills the foot down to provide some numbness so that they don't feel anything. We're not working on the skin for the most part, we're working on the, on the nails. Um, and basically, what I do is we try not to stack the, we basically trace out the nail, not stacking the pulses. And we do the whole nail uh, in a circular manner from top to bottom, and I also do on the skin of the proximal nail groove where the matrix is. And when we then go to the other foot, when we do this, we want to make sure that there's not going to be any discomfort, so we put the ice pack on the other foot, and then come over and do the other one. And we do, the, we do this, patient leaves. We also make the patient, uh, one of the things that we're concerned about is reinfection, since basically the biggest question we want to ask when we have somebody with myconic nails is the, is the first verse of YMCA, why? Why does this, why does this person have this, have this fungus, okay? And basically, if you think about the environment that a foot is in, it's in a warm, moist, dark atmosphere of the shoe. I always ask patients, I said, what's the one article of clothing you never wash? And I always warn them, I said, if you say underwear, I'm leaving the room. <laughs> but uh, they say, I eventually get shoe. But basically, what we do, there's a, I'll give another plug, uh, and there's probably some other brands out there, but the one I use is just, it's a company, uh, they make a device called a Stary Shoe. Stary Shoe is a shoe tree with an ultraviolet light at the end of it. And you turn it on and it sterilizes the shoe that the patient's gonna wear the next day. We also make sure they use topical antifungal as soon as we uh, finish the nail procedure. Uh, because microscopically, what the NDEAG laser does is it turns the nail into Swiss cheese. And it's very uh, permeable to everything at that point. You can use the, the topical antifungals. We also have them change their bed sheet at night. We don't want them going back into whatever bed sheet they have that may have some, some nail dust on it to, to do that. Basically, we, uh, the way our protocol works is we then have them use the, the <coughs> topical antifungal in this dairy shoe for the next four weeks. We see them four weeks later, and we repeat the uh, five millimeter and the two millimeter uh, exercise. Have, basically, have them continue using the antifungal. And again, because we're you're treating patients here and not just nails, if there are other problems the patient has, be it uh, problems the way they're bearing weight, be it uh, circulatory problems, be it a problem with a hammer toe, we may correct these during the period of time because what ends up happening, we want, if you think back to the beginning of the speech here, which I know is difficult to do, but what we're talking here is that you, we are treating and trying to kill fungus. You need to run a pathology test uh, at the, and I, I wait three months after the second treatment to do this. If it comes back negative, we're great. That, you know, I have not had a, in the, in the little, little uh, under two years I've been doing this, I haven't had a reoccurrence. Um, if not, then we go through a second double treatment of the five millimeter spot size, the two millimeter spot size, and using the antifungal. The, let me check, go to my results here, hold on. Okay. Of the 200 patients this study was based on, 90% of the patients tested negative for toenail fungus after, so it would basically be um, four months after we, after we initially treated the patient, because sometimes these tests take about up to six months up to six weeks to, to get the KOH and the, and the PAS test back. Um, of the 10% are tested positive, after we did the second protocol of two more, two more swipes, 80% uh, uh, of them tested negative after the course of treatments were repeated. There's been two patients who have, uh, who we've gone up to three times, and nobody has, we have not had any situations where we, we have not been able to treat the fungal nails. But again, we're very tight on protocol. Is if they don't have, even if I would, would bet my life on the fact that they have fungal nails, if they can't, if I can't prove it on, on lab tests, we don't do it. We don't do it. Um, uh, here. 
Okay. What I'd like to do is this. Uh, is, it, is Dr. Hockman here? Is that the, no. 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 Okay. I, I think you make a very good point that even though they're fungally negative, the nail appearance can still be poor. Correct. And patients ha have that misconception that that means the fungus is still there. Correct. And there's so many things that can cause that that are, it's it's. You know, so we, we get into that conversation with patients. You have to really make a point of understanding that, because a lot of people do this, uh, you know, but again, th there are many reasons to do this. And again, I can tell a personal story. For uh, I I'm the son of a, of a podiatrist. I always calls myself a, a, a midget standing on the shoulder of a giant. And my, my dad um, was practiced with me for many years. He was in podiatry for close to 40 years. And he, he, he passed away of end-stage Alzheimer's last year at the age of 91. And... Uh, um, one of the, the uh, regrets I had was that near the end of his life, uh, because his, he was eating so poorly and his circulation was so bad, he developed mycotic nails. And at that point, we didn't treat them, and it started getting into his bloodstream toward the end of his life. So there's heavy-duty health reasons yeah. to get that stuff off of your body besides uh, van vanity. And you have to make that point to your patients. Um, so basically, uh, Dr. Hockman did a uh, study also that was pretty similar to the results that we found in ours. And what she found is that the eight, a little, little smaller uh, size, but eight patients treated after culture or PAS confirmed the presence of the fungus. One patient had fungus beneath the fingernails. All others had it between the toenails. Two to three treatments per patient spaced three weeks apart. A little less time than I use. I like the four-week time. Uh, fluence level was 223 joules per square centimeter. Culture of PS staying repeated after the final treatment. Again, I do it three months after the final treatment. That's what I've found from the pathology lab. I've said it takes that amount of time for the nail to begin to, to grow out. Uh, and her pathology testing confirmed the absence of fungus in 87.5% of the cases, so it's pretty similar to my 90%. And the laser treatments were very well tolerated by all patients. And, let me get to that slide. And here's the before and after picture. This is pretty similar. Um, and you can see, as you know, nails grow out from proximal to distal. So the last place it's going to clean up is the distal aspect. And I was just talking to a podiatrist at the break, and he was uh, concerned about the way the nails look between the first and second treatment. And I, just, I said, you know, I, I gave him the same advice that I, that I, I give to my wife when my 14-year-old granddaughter is, is, uh, is acting up. I said, don't look. <laughs> don't, don't look. You know, don't, even bother, don't even bother. I tell patients, we're not interested. We're, we're in the process of, of uh, making a hot dog here. Okay? Disgusting looking but delicious at the end. So the thing is, is that after, after the second treatment, you know, we're gonna go, we'll, we'll, go, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it at that point. Let me move on here. Again. Dr. Raj Kumar, come on up. Why don't you sit on the panel? I hate to see you keep. Uh, see. <laughs> what is a gynecologist doing treating you? <laughs> <laughs> That's easy to answer. I'm qualified to treat between the left and the right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see I've lowered the standards here. That's okay. <laughs> Be that as it may, this unfortunate soul has been carrying this soul for years on end. And the settings are there, flow into 223. She had this one course of treatment. And if, as a fool, I could give the wise one counsel, rather than freezing their feet for 10 minutes, I use a 1 to 2% lidocaine, okay. ring block, and you're happy. This girl had a high pain threshold level, but the first time I've ever seen a screen. When we hit that meal without local anesthetic, we had to stop gave her the local anesthetic, and she was smiling on her way out. So I would strongly recommend that. Why I'm on my feet, Joe, on behalf of the audience, can I take this opportunity? Thank you very much. A well-organized conference. Regret that we didn't get melasma. Well, we, we will. We're going to get to it. We'll, we'll get, it we're gonna get to it. Great. Then we stay for tonight. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last is, if possible, with a panel of this sort, if we can get the email addresses with today's technology, if I have a difficult case, I brought along a whole heap of them on my phone to ask the experts, how would you treat? Right. So I can stay my end of the world, doing for the best in the world, and get their opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. I use a Zimmer to cool, and I don't have an issue. A Zimmer is a cooling machine. It's, I have it because of so many of my lasers, and I just blow really cold air through the Zimmer onto the patient's feet, and they tolerate it very well. Dr. Hepburn, what do you use? What do you use? I started using the Zimmer, and okay. then I got concerned that maybe I was compromising the treatment. Um, so what I, when I'm using the two millimeter lens, because um, I started with Lisa Hockman's protocol, where you did two passes, and that's quite intense. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but I made sure that I didn't twist Please. the lens so that I was giving a stronger treatment, and I did find people <coughs> did tolerate it. But more recently, I've switched over, and this is really new, but the results, initial results, are amazing um, to using um, the five millimeter lens, just two passes at 41 joules per centimeter okay. square. And what I do is um, use 0.6 for the fingernails and 1.5 for the toenails. Okay. And I think I sent you some of the pictures. It's amazing how in a short, even week to week, you're seeing the nail grow out, which I don't understand but it's clearing up like rapidly in front of our eyes. But long term, I don't have yet. Okay. So maybe next year we can see. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Do Dr. Kimberbis, do you have a, what do you use cooling? I uh, just want to make a, a comment that you brought very interesting uh, suggestion about the um, educating people uh, that we are treating the fungus, we're not treating the appearance of the nail. And right. that has to be brought up in the consultation and advise people about that and then I think it'll come later on. Right, right. I also, I don't know about you, but I, I do look for a moccasin pattern of tinea first. I do not start treating the nails until I treat most of the foot because to me it doesn't make any sense if I, I'll make them wait two weeks, four weeks till I get the foot treated, um, especially if it's in between the toes, and then I'll hit the nails because otherwise going into the shoe, like you said, that environment, it, it serves no purpose to me. Yeah, most, most of the time, I, since we're, I'm, I'm waiting sometimes up to six weeks, sometimes it'll be very interesting. You'll see, you know, we get the three different results microscopically, PAS and KOH. And sometimes the first two will be negative and, and the third one is positive. So you just, it takes some time. But in the meantime, we're treating it. We start on an antifungal. We start on a lot of different things. So go from there. Let me move on here. This is a before and after from Dr. Mark Garfield, who's not here. Uh, again, uh, spot size, five and two millimeter, three passes, um, which uh, I haven't done before. This is, this is in terms of, a lot of people are saying you do two with a five and one with a two, and it seems a little intense to me. Uh, but you know, I, may, I may try that on a, on a difficult case, or I may try it on one of my ones where I have a, a uh, reoccurrence after the first protocol. That would probably be that would probably be a good idea. Dr. Hepburn, here's one of your cases. Oh yeah, that was my first case actually. Nice um, job. I had a patient who had taken Lamiso orally some time before, and she'd had to stop. And she happened to see somewhere in the <coughs> office that we were doing this, and so she approached us about it. I hadn't started as yet, and um, we did. That's when I use. Um, the higher, I'm trying to think what we have there. That, yeah, we use 1.5 milliseconds, and I think I used level 9, which is, I think, 200 and... How did you know it? It was your first case. How did you have them tolerate the pain? The Zimmer? I did use a Zimmer with her, actually, but oh, she... Okay. I, I started out without it, without using it, and then I went... But she was fine, even without it, to be honest. I don't know how she... I think she was motivated. But um, we did two treatments on her, but by the time I came a month later to do the second treatment, she was, I wish I had the interim. I mean, you could see the nail with like a line across where yeah. the, it was like completely almost up, up to the top, where only the distal portion was left. And she's like, I don't think I need another treatment. I said, well, we're following the protocol, so you're going to do another treatment. And then I, this was um, months and months later she came, because I do skin cancer screening, she came for another visit. And I said, can I just get a picture of your nail? And it was completely clear. Um, the toenails... Um, we, I think our initial results using that very aggressive protocol was, were very good, um, but I think our patients are probably more wimps than maybe what, I don't know, um, in, the, in the study. But, so I'm always looking for ways to, to do it you know, more, with more tolerability. 
Yeah. One of the things I found uh, with really severe mycotic nails is once in a while you'll actually get uh, you know down the line maybe a month or two after the second treatment the uh, the nail will actually evulse and a new nail <coughs> underneath it. I don't know if anybody's seen yeah. that, but uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what that's due to, but, it, but it's, it's, it's good when it happens. Yeah. I, mean, I also it? trim the nail down very often and so that it's not sticking up and it's not around. If you don't have a zimmer or a cooling agent and you don't want to give a ring block, you can use ice. Yeah. Ice in a glove, you just put it on the toe, move it away, hit, do a pass go to the next toes, do the same, and then do your second pass afterwards. Yeah, it, it just, just to be uh, my ornery self, I said this is the Aerolace protocol. I think it's a little rough. Um, and uh, I, I, is it the five millimeter lens with two passes, I haven't seen a need for that. Um, I'd just be concerned that you're producing too much heat in the area. That's, again, I would, I, I would probably try this after the initial protocol has failed if you get a, after the initial protocol, you get a, you get a uh, positive result, then I would go to this, but I, I certainly wouldn't st start off with that, but again, that's just me. Mm -hmm. Question. Question. Sure. How does the toenail look in between treatment? Um, the toenail, you'll start getting some clearing, again, you're going from proximal near the lunula to distal, so you may, in the four week period of time, start seeing some clearing, but again, you said, just remember, you know, my granddaughter acts up. I tell my wife, don't look, okay? It's not, you're not finished yet. It's the protocol re requires two treatments. So automatically, the patient's given a second appointment as soon as you finish with the first one. They, they know they gotta come back. Protocol, this is the, the highlights. The nails has to be flat and thin for maximum laser energy penetration. You need to grind it when necessary. Don't grind it too thin because then it'll be a little bit too uncomfortable. Um, with the handpiece perpendicular, cover the treatment site with sufficiently tight spacing. Don't stack, don't stack it. Don't stack it, don't stack it. Thoroughly treat the surrounding skin, particularly the area of the nail matrix. You also want to go uh, at the hyponychium on the distal aspect underneath the nail. I always get that area as well. Uh, use of the ice pack or the uh, Zimmer or the New Life device for pre-cooling and nail jumping. The nail jumping technique is basically if one nail's hurting him, you go to another one and then come back to the other one af after a while. Uh, the topical antifungal and UV shoe trees can inhibit reinfection between or after treatments. Okay, and here's a little we'll throw this up for the panel, okay. Laser treatment of nail fungus. Do we need to remove the nail? Okay, I'll, I'll basically say no. No. <laughs> no. no. Okay, Dr. Heffern? No. Okay. Uh, no. Okay, okay. When must we grind the nail? Um, when it seems a little thick, uh, they said, uh, I found the penetration of the, of the uh, NDAG lasers are pretty good, so I, you know, once in a while, you'll run a test spot on it and you'll see the thing sparking. If it sparks, you know, I would say at that point you need, you need to grind it down a bit. Panel? Yeah. I, yeah, usually if there's some debris, it'll spark or yeah. somebody has polish on and they didn't get it all off, you missed it, it'll, sp it'll spark. Yeah, you, can, you can toast marshmallows at that point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Should we combine laser with oral therapies? If so, how? For me, that's a big fat no. Okay. Is Lamisil, Spornox, all that poison, okay, basically causes blood dysgrasias, liver problems. It's like uh, there used to be the old commercial, you know, treading a headache for an upset stomach. The cure is worse than the disease. And in this instance, if the protocol is followed properly and you treat it till it's gone, as I said, I haven't seen a situation where a, a because I treat the whole body and I try to, um, as I said, one of the things we find if people have a vasospastic situation going on with their toes, We'll put them on pentoxifoline, which is a really nice, it's not a vasodilator, but it makes the uh, red blood cells more flexible to go through the, the uh, constricted, constricted arterioles to help the circulation. I don't find that a problem. I don't want my patients on poison, but that's, that's just me. So, guys? I don't think I'm as much of a purist as yeah. you. <laughs> um, I just want to get to the end point. Um, I certainly don't feel happy about people using extended, um, you know, three, four months of, of oral antifungals. But if we can 
And I keep looking for different protocols, but if we could find a way of getting the best results with maybe using a couple of weeks at the beginning or the end of laser, I mean, I think it's worth looking at. Um, but short, short, short bursts of, of oral treatments. Um, I'll use them. I won't use them in anybody on multi, you know, polypharmacy. And I got to tell you, a lot of these patients are on polypharmacy um, because they're older, they're diabetics, and um, a lot of them are through the cytochrome P450 system. And so you don't want to break down and go through their drug interaction, and it's pretty significant. Also, just to remind you that generics are not equivalent. So when you're messing up, you know, when people's bloods are all getting messed up, it's because of that. So I, I have no problem writing for them in the right setting. I have absolutely no problem writing for them in, in children. Um, that might seem different to you, but they don't have the same profile as in adults. So, and I am seeing more and more kids with onychomycosis. I don't know about you. Uh, absolutely. And so I am offering them laser because a lot of the parents don't want to do it, but they also don't want to pay for this, and this is a non-covered service. Right. So when I give them the prescription and Lamisil is $800, a Sporinox is 650 they come back, how much are you going to do this for, and we play that little bit of a game. But I, I will use it in the certain settings. Dr. Kibberwas? I do use in Sparnox and Lamazil. Um, just exactly in the situation, if people come in and they want medications, um, very commonly they can't use the medications because their liver function is abnormal, they multi-pharmacy, and you have to give them another option, and um, that's when we have a conversation. Okay. Right. Uh, I charge uh, uh, thirteen seventy five. Uh, I'm in Manhattan and, and White Plains, you know, so that, that may not be the uh, may not work in Kentucky. Her treatment or for both treatments? For the whole, for, for the whole um, shebang. shebang. I, I basically that'll be for as many times as I got to do it. We won't charge them any, anything any, anything more than that. Uh, and we basically we used to charge twelve fifty and give them an option on the on the stereo shoe. But we don't do that anymore. We tell we we we, 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 we say at thirteen seventy five. We take the stereo shoe. We put it into the shoes they're wearing into the office while we're treating them. So they give them starts giving them a, a treatment and then make sure we use it because they're not going to get as good a result if they're not sterilizing the shoes. Guys, you want you want you want to you want to tell, tell them how much you charge? I charge per session. Um, if I'm I, I probably will change after listening to you about treating all ten toes. <laughs> I usually charge two fifty a session up to if it's on you know like five toes and I charge per session and so I don't I do two sessions a month apart and then I wait three months I see what it looks like I don't culture but I probably I culture initially I don't culture at the three months um, I probably will start to do that now and reculture I also look to see if it is you know onico dystrophy or onychomycosis uh, and look to see the history. So I, I pretty much am in that range of 250 to 500 per session. Dr. Hepburn? I don't quite remember what we charge, but I think um, when we were doing two sessions, because now I remember I've changed to four sessions, four weekly sessions. Um, but when we were doing two sessions, I think it was anywhere from three to 600, depending on how many toes. And like you, like you said, uh, Stan, probably need to look at doing all 10. Um, I encourage patients to do, and I explain to them that, look, some of these may be infected and you don't want to get cross-infection, but there are a lot of people that insist, oh, no, I just want to treat the ones that, you know, that I see. Uh, I, I think and we've actually done pretty well doing that. You know? I, I think patient control is a big thing. They said one of the things you have to do is, is uh, you know, I, they have no choice. They tell them when they come to my office, <coughs> it's tenor, it's tenor or, or the highway. <coughs> Well, yeah. that might be a good thing for us to change. Yeah, to. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You, I just want to say you have a very generous offer for them that you treat as yeah. much as as much as oh. needed until they're better. Because I, I, I think in in that uh, situation, people can reinfect. You taking a lot of chances, and I. <laughs> but Again. do you put in a medical visit? Yeah, yeah, we're we're, we're we're billing for X-rays right. and. Okay, yeah. so. 
So then it's more feasible to do that because you're billing and you're doing a medical visit with it. Yeah, no, they don't, you don't take up a collection for me. That's, that's Okay. <laughs> we're not. We're not. <laughs> you know, when you're doing these things, I think that's a good question about billing. You know, when you're doing these acne procedures and if you're doing acne extractions or you're doing ILK and, you know, you're on packages and stuff for your patients, you definitely can do medical visits with it. There's nothing wrong with that. Just be upfront with your patients. Absolutely. Question. Okay, so we've started using the Neo Alpha with great results. So I, I do a very aggressive, you know, the five millimeter, then the two millimeter. And on the two millimeter lens, I might do two or three passes on the exposed portion. And my patients Maybe. are really good, but I have an ice pack under their toes, and I have one I hold on top on the foot I'm not doing. So they're kind of iced in between. They go home, they're fine, no problem. I'm going to try the 1.5 though. I'm looking forward to that. But the patients who you culture and they come back negative and you would have put money down that they were fungal, what do you do for those? At that point, you. Okay, yeah. other than fix the hammer top. Well, the thing is this is that there's something else causing it, okay? As much as me, we may want it to be mycotic or yeast or something, and you can always re, re if you're not sure of the lab, you may want to recul reculture it. But if it comes back negative again, then you're barking up the wrong tree. Then you have to look into uh, hormonal reasons. You have to check, uh, uh, again, check circulation. You have to see, see position when they're walking. Um, and that's trauma. Trauma, yeah. Are any of you using like urea 40 on the nails? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, what I yeah. want to know is, okay, I've eliminated that. Yeah. I know, you know, I've addressed the mechanics. It's not psoriasis or even psoriasis. Like, what are you using? So. Urea. So I definitely use urea. The nail, the Kara stick, the nail, the nail stick, the urea nail stick that I use. Um, Formula three. Even I though I use that a lot, I'll add salicylic acid as well. Uh, besides urea, the foam Salvex. Uh, I'll go to those things, and then I send them down the block. <laughs> <laughs> It's a long block. <laughs> to my are, friend. Are any of you also using urea in combination with the laser? No. Because um, I had some patients have. that were already using urea on the nails and an antifungal, which works well mixed together for patients who aren't interested. And it seems to me the ones that I've been using, I use the Steri Shoe. They bleach their shower. I tell them not to use a bath mat when they get out of the shower. They should put a towel on the floor. I mean, I'm really aggressive. I have a whole page of things for them. They, you know, change. Their That's shoes. very nice, but I can guarantee you they're not doing all well, that. Well, I ask them, and they tell me they are. Well, they're lying. They're lying. Yeah. You know, there was a study done that put a chip. Fran, you might know this. That put a chip into the cap of medications. And they brought in for 30 days, they monitored the medication. It was a pill a day or a cream a day. And I think the number was something like 20% used it every yeah. day the way they were supposed to. If you look at yourself, if I get sick and I go on Zithromax, I get two pills in and then I'm done. I mean, it would be real. we have to be realistic. The patients are not doing They could promise you till kingdom come. They're not doing it. If you make it too difficult for them, right. they're not going to do it. They'll, they'll lose interest. They'll things happen in their lives. The ones that I found that were using I think their I results agree. were right. a little better. And so I in. added that to yeah, my protocol also, and it's noticeable too. I, I agree with that. Urea is excellent because it takes down the thickness of it and it helps. Dr. Hepburn, you using urea? No, but I think I will. Okay. Can we, Dr. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I also will use urea. Okay, I good. didn't get a chance. Just, just one second because I can't help myself. Okay, I used to do this. I had hepatitis uh, my practice, and I had this in the nail area. You want to help your clients with compliance, and I know that that's the most difficult portion to do, especially when they go with the tincture twice a day, and the this, and the that. There is a line out there, and this I have nothing to do with them, it's called Food Logics. Food Logics is probably the most attractive, beautiful product that's going to take care of everything the skin, the food, the tinea. At the same time, they have a beautiful tincture also, this professional C3. It's a beautiful line because it's really attractive. 
and these women, they had a more cream that has a little bit of urea in it, like emo, you know, emollient cream from Gordon Labs. It's beautiful. They buy it on the spot. They love it because it's attractive also. So if anybody wants to look into Food Logics, please be my guest. Food Logics is cream. We'll just go through the last questions here. Some of them have been answered. Should we combine with topical fungicide? The answer is yes. Uh, how necessary is pathology? Vital. Again, we're treating. We're treating people, we're treating fungal nails here, mycotic nails here. Yeah. You've got to know what you're working. Uh, as as uh, uh, George Harrison used to have a song that said, to, um, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And basically, if you don't know what you're dealing with in your nails, then you don't know what you're treating. Question. Um, I have seen a clinical practice where there are cases where the, the fungal test comes back negative, but clinically, you can tell it's definitely oligomycosis and you go on a clinical judgment. So does anybody else use their clinical judgments only, even when the fungal test is negative? Um, so I, I see your point, and I think we all do that kind of, you, you could do that with acne treatments when you're treating P. acnes and you think it's resistant. You know, we all use our clinical judgment. But I think with toenails, you, ha you have to be careful. People are paying for it out of their pocket. And if you can't um, be accurate in your diagnosis, you can tell them up front, you know, clinically I suspect that. I, I think a lot of it has to do with age. Very often psoriasis it looks right. very much like onychomycosis, and you get trapped into that. And the last thing I want to do is give money back to a patient, right. you know, I, for a failed treatment because nothing happened. You, you don't know. You don't know what you're treating. The thing is, 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 is because you will not produce a reduction in the thickness of the nail unless the thickness is secondary to the nail reacting to the mycosis. So the question is, is. Uh, are you ablating? Are you, right. you know, it's, it's, what are you doing? Right. I, I don't know. Right, no, I understand. I'm a dermatologist in Jamaica and I treat a lot, you know, with the anti oral antifungals, even when it's fungally negative and I get great results anyway. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking there are some so, cases that you're just going to. So here, here in so the States, you patient, can't do that. <laughs> patient, um, your patient information is key and the expectations. As you said, you have to be very clear with them. And if they're willing to go along with it, Knowing that it's negative, I think that um, you know sometimes you have to go to clinical judgment because it can be difficult sometimes Absolutely. in the best of cases to um, culture nails. Uh, you're 100 percent correct, but here for sure, with with prescription coverages, very often they ask for the positive culture. Correct. And so you can't get it covered. And when you tell a patient it's 800 dollars for one month, and they, you want them on three months. They, they don't want to do Lamisil or Sporanox. They just don't want to do it. You, they'll be willing to try the laser if you keep it more right. reasonable, but you don't know what your endpoint's going to be. Let me just get the last question in here. The best approach to reinfection, you guys have already heard my approach. Susan? Same. Okay. Same. Yeah. Dr. Heffern? Yeah, yeah. Very similar. I mean, okay. we do the same things with the sheets and shower okay. salt. Good. And can I just ask <coughs> something? Um, I think a good prevention and a very inexpensive more natural treatment by it takes patients is uh, vinegar soaks. And before I knew about airlines, I had successfully accomplished that. It might take a year or two, and there is a lifestyle modification of being either barefoot or in flip-flops most of the year. So you wear your boots in the snow, you come inside, you switch. And you can totally get rid of it in most cases. And I think it could be combined with air lace very successfully afterwards or in between treatments. With the soaking protocol you're using, how much vinegar are you using? Uh, the loot is 50-50 in any kind of dish that can accommodate a foot. And some of my patients as executives sat at the desks soaking their foot underneath as they were working. And uh, you know, then they got up and did their stuff and they did it in the evening while watching TV, but it worked. Okay. So I, I use soaks, vinegar soaks for pseudomonal infections only. Yeah, I use, I, I, I've been using uh, vinegar and betadine soaks post-operatively on my, on my uh, bone and soft tissue surgery for years. I use evaporative soaks. It, uh, reduces, it reduces the pH of a wound site, 
And the more acidic a wound site, the less, less likely it is to become uh, bacterially infected. Anyway, so let me, let me move on here. We'll move on to treatment of warts. point of view. Um, I, I know that, you know, uh, we would be very interested to see if somebody trying 1.5 millisecond and what results will be. But it looks like, you know, sometimes, you know, it may not be as you know, real. I don't know. But uh, all science shows that, you know, uh, 1.5 should be more painful than 0 0.65, which is of course. And the only reason what, but uh, you know, in order to affect a target, let's say smaller targets, you know, you need shorter pulse duration. So 1.5 millisecond, you know, I would use if you think that it's not enough, eight, energy mode eight, yeah. which would be, uh, let's say uh, on, and you, you want to go high affluence to Nine. 10, mm which would be 25% more. So to use this, let's say the same energy, the same fluent, but 1.5 may not add anything. So, but then you are simply applying too much energy. So maybe you should simply switch to, let's say two millimeter spot or three millimeter spot, right? And you can get, you know, you know, so I don't think that you want to go, let's say to 318 joules per centimeter square and on two millimeter spot. Because if two millimeter uh, with 0 0.65, it's 255 joules per centimeter square. If you believe that it's already, you know. Right. I think all your studies are showing nine and, and, and ten, ten and modes. Nine, yeah. we, we're all using the higher fluence. Right. Based on the study. Yeah, we're all using the higher fluence. Okay. So, uh, no, we, our protocol now is using eight and 255. Oh, that's what I was saying. That was clear, okay. okay. Um, we're all pushing it. <laughs> okay. Warts, clinical cases, ARLH protocol, and key discussion points. I'll let Dr. Rosenberg go through this on the next slides here. Susan? Uh, th yeah, this, this one is Dr. Garfield, actually. Right. Oh, Dr. Garfield, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, Dr. Garfield's not here, uh, so I'll try to do a Dr. Garfield imitation. Uh, fluence, 21 joules per square, square centimeter. Pulse width is 0. 0.6 microseconds. Spot size is 6 millimeters. One pass, and this is for a skin type 2. Uh, usually, the wart is debrided prior to... Right. Um, I would I would probably debride it down to pinpoint bleeding. Um, that's exactly how you know you got a wart if you're not getting a biopsy on this, and uh, it's done for a weekly visit <coughs> until you get a situation where you can debride the area and there's no pinpoint uh, bleeding. Okay, so this patient of mine came in, had multiple cryo treatments, had um, multiple immunomodulators, nothing worked on it, so I gave her the option. She said, come on, can't you do the laser? And so I said, sure. Um, so I, I'm a little more aggressive. I, I did on her, I did mode 8, 255. It says one pass. I believe I did two passes with the two millimeter spot. I do send them home on um, usually 40% salicylic acid. I do do that. I do debride it beforehand, and I do code this as a 17110. Um, this is a medical visit that I put it through as, and I usually do it every two weeks. Um, they tolerate it very well. I want to make one note. These are viral particles to HPV. Please use a evacuator. I do not do these without, I'll also use my Zimmer to cool because I'm going pretty strong, but I do use a, an evacuator or I put a mask on 
or my staff because the last thing I want is this in my throat. Right, right. What, what a lot of people do also is uh, uh, when, I, when I do one of these, I, I will use cantharone, antineoplastic agent on the, on the lesion uh, under occlusion for a day. <coughs> me. Pam, you want to come on up? It's your case. Pam Bennett, come on down. <laughs> All right, um, this hand belongs to the director of the emergency room in a local uh, hospital. And uh, she had the uh, nail, she, she actually had two, one on the ring finger, and then she had some contact spread to the, the small finger, the pinky. And uh, she had treated previously in the ER using topicals with no result. And then they froze them with no result. And then she actually was coming to our spot to have some facial treatments and asked me, what did I think? And I said, well, of course we can do it. You know, we will just follow the protocol and we'll, we'll work it out. And this was, I think, one of the earlier protocols <coughs> that they had written for warts. And so basically, um, we did debulk the warts before we treated them. And we used an ice pack to cool for a pre-cool for like three to four minutes before we began treatment. And it was treated using a two millimeter spot size. We used a 1.5 millisecond setting on an energy mode of eight. And treated two, pa we did two passes, that's pretty hot, 255 joules per square centimeter. Um, we did two passes over, over the area itself and, and again, the evacuator, I don't have an evacuator. But I will tell you that if I treat a wart, I am double gloved, I'm double masked, and I'm face shielded, and I'm wearing a lab coat. So I'm, I try to be a little, <laughs> I look like the mad scientist in there, but like you, I don't, I don't want to breathe it, and I don't want it in my face. You know, I know, I know, that's, you gotta that's something I gotta do. Uh, but anyway, we treated it two passes, did a ring of pulses also around the periphery, and she was slated to come back and actually didn't come back. So the second treatment was actually done 52 days after the first treatment. And then this, the pictures over there, the post pictures are taken five months after the second treatment. <coughs> so she had really good clearance. She's had no recurrence at all. And, and we did have to stop during the treatment several times. That's a very, very sensitive area, and your pain yeah. level there is just right through the roof. We didn't numb right. with anything but ice, and we, we, would st we would do two or three shots, and then she would say, that's enough. We'd grab the ice, sit it on there for a couple of minutes, and then try again, and it, it worked great. How did you debulk? Uh, she debulked before she came to me and just actually took cl little clippers and actually trimmed and just got as close as she could before we treated. I did not have her use anything. This is strictly laser. That's it. Nothing more. And the treatment that she had had previously, which was the freezing and then the, you know, the topicals they had used in the ER were probably eight to nine months before she presented to me with the warts. I don't use anything either. One of the things, again, uh, with, with warts as a, as a podiatrist is many times I'll find that, again, the... Uh, YMCA question, why? Why is this patient getting a wart? Many times you'll find that it's on weight-bearing surfaces, so sometimes there's biomechanical reasons why a patient is getting that. Now, I will check that out. Uh, we have a device called an F-Scan. It's a uh, computerized uh, uh, gait analysis that gives us an idea of how, how this is going on. So basically, a lot of our wart patients end up uh, getting into orthotics because to balance up an area, because it, an area in a child, we all know that the you develop a resistance to the wart virus at around between 25 and 35. And these are people who later on in life develop uh, intractable plantar keratomas in these areas. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. But I, I don't use anything uh, between treatments. Do you, 
How about the panel? Susan? I do. You do? What do you use? Um, I just recently started using Virasal. Um, it, it's a true 27% salicylic acid brush on, and it's, you have to write a prescription for it. The 40, I used to use 40% pads by Dr. Scholl's, but Oof. they're not, but they're not true pads. I, I also use some um, compounded um, products that have a bunch of stuff in it. I do like Verigen, and I do use a lot of Zyclara. I'll try anything because they're they're miserable. A lot of these patients, so I'll try anything and do these treatments every two weeks. Dr. Hepburn, do you use anything between uh, between more treatments? Yes. Uh, well, I use multiple treatments. Sometimes I'll combine um, Cantharidin. I think you mentioned that. Sometimes I'll combine combine Cantharidin with other treatments like um, laser or liquid nitrogen. And we've been all we actually used to use a. a a combination of, uh, I don't know if you have it still in the Caribbean, you used to use Dior plant. Do you still have that? In the Caribbean, I don't know if you still have it. Um, we, can't, we haven't been able to get it for a while, so I'm, I want to see what you're using. Um, but then I started also just occluding it, like with some IV3000 for okay. that occlusive effect, okay. and that seems to really help uh, reduce the number of treatments. Dr. Kibberboss? I don't know if anybody heard about duct tape regimen. Oh, right, yeah. I mean, the occlusion, yeah. Occlusion. Yeah. Yes, that uh, works great, and, between, and probably the laser, uh, if you do it before the treatment, um, it just helps to, I guess, to kill it faster. That, that's, that's Mehmet Oz's favorite treatment for, uh, yeah. for, 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 for I works. think it's just the brighting it, I, I, you know, so yeah, that's it's, why. Yeah. It's just, that's, you could do the same thing with the salicylic acid pads or Band-Aids in that. The, one of the compounds I use has 5-FU in it, even. Feeling behind the duct tape is that it blocks the oxygen to the wart, actually. Question, if I may? Sure. As the gynecologist falling the teeth in that corner, <laughs> <laughs> is there any correlation, and I know of none, between these females, cervical cancer and oral cancer? Those singers have a straight habit of finding themselves in big places. I see to you guys, <laughs> but my mom, but my pay grade. I don't know of any studies on that. I don't believe so. It's a different virus. It's not right. um, an oncogenic one, and so cervical cancer is an oncogenic HPV. And um, I think we know from Michael Douglas that he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yodeling in the valley, right? Yeah. So I think that um, I, I think that. For the most part, this is a totally different numbered virus. These are not oncogenic ones. Any differences, Dr. Hepburn, Dr. Kibberwass? Yes, it's a different virus and I treated differently. So then still in the States, can you use any silver nitrate solutions in order to treat topically? Yes. I, or it's too archaic? I use, I use no. silver nitrate sticks uh, sometimes on warts followed by cantharone under occlusion. Works very yeah. nicely. Very nice. Yeah. Is Dr. O'Malley here? Mm -hmm. Dr. Susan O'Malley, come on One down. Question. Sure, let, just, let, just let this nice lady pass for us. Tell us. Hi, Susan, come on. Have you ever treated warts on a patient and they come back 30 years afterwards with the ward in the same location? Sure. 30 years, 30 years afterwards? Yeah, uh -huh. 30 years? Yeah, tons of stuff, right. <laughs> Well, the thing is this, is from what I understand, and again, I can, I'll, I'll see it to you guys, is that the, the human body, because you never see, you, it's rare you see, you see, you see a plantar sure. warts in adults. You may see them on their hands. You don't see it on a foot. Uh, usually around somewhere between 35 and 40, they develop a resistance. So what I find when many times when adults come in and say, oh, doc, I got a wart back here, I'll debride it. There's no pinpoint bleeding. If, there, if there's no pinpoint bleeding on a wart, a plantar's wart, it's not a plantar's wart. It may be a porokeratosis, maybe an intractable plantar keratoma, <coughs> uh, maybe something something else. Uh, uh, but it's not it's not a wart. So the tr trick is this: if it comes back at that point, I would certainly you know want to identify what you have. You need to biopsy it, biopsy it. But I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, from 35 years of treating feet, you just you don't you don't see uh, once you get above 35 to 40. You don't you just don't see uh, planners worse than adults. You don't. Let me I'll open the panel for two seconds. Okay. You guys. Just well, none of us have been in practice thirty-five years, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm not that far off, actually. I, I've been in practice since 1980, 1992. Um, but you see recurrent warts all the time. And very often, like anything, it comes back in the area that they originally were. I would, wouldn't call it the same one, but they very often weight-bearing areas or stuff come right. in. I do see plantar warts in adults, especially in athletes or people that are, that I, I know you're. Well, I, I'll just, excuse me, I'll just make a statement on that. Um, many times, several times, probably at least half a dozen in the 20 years I've been in practice where I've had people who've had very painful sub net fives, what I consider to be IPKs, to the point where they would produce neuroma-like symptoms deep. Excise the IPK, the dermatopathologist comes back and sends it Well, I, I think so just on a point of that, these, these are an elderly adult. I think yeah, is it a dermatopathologist reading it, or is it a Quest yeah. pathologist reading it? Yeah. Well, in, in, in that's in all fairness, yeah, that's no, a very, I, very I, key. I, I know it is key. I know it is key. The most recent one was a dermatopathologist reading. Prior to that, we have had the OR, you know, the, the surgical center OR Quest pathologist that passed, right. and those are yeah. questionable. But since uh, we've had some. Profession-specific dramatopath labs open up and heavily market to us, which we've been using in the past five years or so. Uh, the most recent one did come back as a Veruca vulgaris from an older adult person. So I, I won't say it's like anything else. Uh, you know, anything I possible, they do show up. And this clearly was everything we've been trained as as an intractable plantar keratoma. Right. Uh, no pinpoint bleeding. Uh, skin line disruption is always questionable when they're that dense, though. So just to make a point. Okay. Let me turn over. Let me turn over. Uh, this is Dr. O'Malley's case here on these wards. Let me turn it over to her. She's been waiting nice and patiently here. Thank you. Hello. So this is my spa manager, and she went to the gym so that she could get healthy, and instead she got this stinking wart. <laughs> so I had never treated a wart. So I opened the Aerolace book and I used the protocol that was there for everyone to see. So it was a spot size of two millimeters, a pulse width of 1.5, uh, which came out to 223 joules. The next day, and I just, I, there's, I don't know if you can appreciate it, but there's actually three lesions to this one wart. So I zapped each one just one time. The next day, this was not a happy wart. This was angry and, oh, hanging on for dear life. You could, you want, because I, I watched it every day, you could watch it get better every day. Um, I zapped it again exactly four weeks later, same exact protocol, four weeks later, three, again three. About a week after the second treatment, it was totally gone. I just did the third treatment as an insurance policy four weeks after that, and this is two months after the third treatment. And she doesn't go to the courts. Can we treat planters' warts? The answer is yes. And I think the panel concurs with that. How does laser compare with other modalities? Um, basically, I have a fairly high success rate with uh, treating warts because I look for the underlying reasons. So my, my, all my pathology the treatments are good. And I've always had good results with lasers even before the uh, NDAG laser. With CO2 laser, I used to cut out the, lab, the, the wart for uh, pathology and then uh, spark the base. Uh, we had a good result with high recators, but the, the, the uh, ladies in the panel can answer whether the question is how does laser compare, the ND YAG laser compare with other modalities. Susan? Um, you know, I think you have to be realistic with warts. I think that's a great case. It responded quickly. Planters, warts, they're, they're resistant. They're tough no matter what you do. This just is another thing in our armamentarium to go after them. And um, I tend not to use this on little kids uh, because it's hard enough getting them to sit. And as I told you, I'm not so nice. I'm mean, and you know, I, I get them to sit. But um, I, I really am nice. I just, you know, I don't know. I don't know if my husband will agree in the back of the room. But no, um, I use this recurrently, and it's just in my armamentarium, and it's very successful for us. Dr. Hubbard? Yeah. Oh, okay, she's got it. 
I use all sorts of different yeah. um, cool, methods. Cool I use all sorts of different methods. I use cryotherapy, laser. I, I mean, the laser is actually a newer thing for me, so it's hard for me to compare it. So you don't have a comparison yet? Yeah. The, the I mean, laser for warts is a newer thing. Give her, yeah. give us. It's a wonderful option for uh, treatment uh, of the warts, and uh, again, you have to uh, use it as anything, and there is a price involved, and some people don't want to spend money on that, and right. uh, you have to consider that. Right. Okay. Don't, don't hit the bell yet, so we'll keep going. Okay. Pain management. Uh, Pulse width, 26 milliseconds, three to four passes. Shows a number of joules up there. Uh, numerous sessions typically needed, spaced apart by week. The clinical efficacy is basically joints. It's, it's still under study, but we've got some very good clinical feedback. And good. I think we'll expand more into this area and, and feedback to everybody some more as it, as it develops further. Okay. Healing scar revision. Um, my my uh, uh, neurosesthetician was supposed to be here today to talk a little bit about spider veins, but she had a death in the family, so she, she, she sends her regrets. But if you, anybody's interested, if they contact my office, I'll put, I'll put Jeannie in contact with you guys, and she can talk to you about what she setting shoes for spider veins. Uh, wound healing, we've just started using it in our OR. Since I do a lot of minimally invasive procedures, uh, we're using it in a very low setting uh, over the top of it, um, and the results are preliminary, so I, I can't speak on that. Has anybody else used it for wound healing at all? Yeah, I, I use it. You do? You do. Come. The periphery up. Periphery? What, what, what settings? Just like the, the facial rejuvenation. The gentleman over here says it's, you, your name is? Dubirala. Dr. Dubirala? Yes. Sorry, mispronouncing it. He's, he's, he, good. He uses, uses the, the uh, settings for photo rejuvenation on the wound. On the periphery of the wound, not on the wound itself. Oh, a periphery, a periphery around the wound. Um, yeah. Yeah, both of uh, us. Yeah. Well, go ahead, you start now. I don't do a lot of wound healing, but no. the ones we have treated have been absolutely amazing. Uh, the the um, rapidity of which it responds is just, I just can't, almost can't believe it. The patients can't believe it. I'm not sure where the mechanism of action is, but what we tend to do is two to three passes over the wound and a bit of the surrounding skin. Um, I'm trying to remember what we started with. I have, the I have yeah. one of the cases here and yeah. two, two of Suzanne's first, and then okay. I have your foot ulcer case. Okay, you do yours okay. first, okay. Suzanne. So I, I absolutely love this tr um, treatment, and I use this routinely, especially on all my elderly patients. These two I'll tell you about in a second, but you know how your elderly patients have skin tears and you can't suture them, you can't do anything. If you put a tape dressing on it, it just tears further. I do this twice a week on them. It's covered by Medicare, it's covered by your insurance companies, and it is unbelievable. So this patient is a, was about a 55-year-old morbidly obese woman who had this um, venous ulcer ended up being a venous ulcer. It was traumatic. It started from her hitting the edge of a bed. She saw a local doctor for nine months, was treated with honey. Now, I know there are a lot of countries that like honey, and we do honey studies here, but after nine months, when she walked into my office, it was just a disaster. So I started using um, the Neo, and multiple, multiple treatments right through the wound I went. I did it on low settings because this does hurt. So if you think that a power mode of three doesn't hurt, on this it hurts. So that I listen to my patients. And I do multiple passes. I do about two or three passes to get through it. I treat the whole area around. Once I got her closed, I did do sclerotherapy. I did do a Doppler on her immediately, just so you know because um, I'm medical-based as well, and I did a Doppler on her, and we worked routinely with wound care, compression, and uh, she couldn't tolerate a una boot, so I did this twice a week with her, and she did phenomenal. I mean, this woman walks around singing my praises because she was so lost and couldn't do anything. So that's that case. I, this girl went zip lining and got caught in the zip line. She was 17 years old and walked into my office absolutely hysterical, her mother hysterical. I said, okay, I'm going to do laser on you. 
her, I believe I charged because um, she was like zip lining in Costa Rica and you know paid for it there. So <laughs> why should I do that for twenty bucks? Anyway, um, so she did five treatments really back to back, like every two three days. I met her on the weekend. I held her hand through this, and we got her. The last part is right behind the knee in the popliteal fossa. Uh, after two more treat, I have the pictures. I don't know why they're not here. Um, gone, gone. And all she's left, I recently, this was like two years ago, she basically has nothing there. And I still continued to treat the red area afterwards. So once I got her, I got her closed down so quickly. It was great. It was really, really terrific. Only laser, you know what, I did put silvadine on there. When they are a burn type of thing, I do put silvadine. I just recently found a great cream. Actually, I was speaking for a product in Alabama and Mississippi. I was telling them in the back, and every office down there had Neocutis Biogel and Bio Cream, and it's just a phenomenal healing ointment for afterwards. But I, I can tell you, unequivocally that Leo, the Neo did this, the laser did this. This was not the creams or anything, that this continually treatment. I, I have patients with these tears that normally would take, you know, three months to heal, and I have them healed in two, three weeks. And it's, they're very debilitating. They come in all bloody. And between, I think it's neogenesis, neocollagen, it's neovascularization that you're creating on this low setting, and I think that's why it works on the joint pain as well. That's the uh, photo. Uh, um, no, it's pain. even less, I think. Okay. I use e I use a, a mode of three, which is less, less than photofacial. Okay. This is wound healing. I'm not going after red here. I'm not going after right. anything there. And the skin is usually very thin, so I don't go to 1.5 on these. I don't change any of that. I do three millimeter spot, uh, six millimeter spot. I don't go less than that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just reading my settings because I couldn't remember. Um, this is a patient who actually um, has multiple, um, she's kept getting these multiple uh, painful ulcerations on the foot. And I see her for skin cancer screening, so I'd heard about the wound healing. And I said, oh, let me just, you know, try it. And this, actually, this picture is actually after one treatment. Yeah. Um, I, I think we did another one that day, but it was pretty much healed by the time she came back again. Um, she ended up getting a few. We sent her off for revaluation with the vascular surgeon. Um, but, it, you know, the, the response was incredible. It really works. I'm telling you, for, if, for this wound healing, I can't give you the exact mechanism. I think it's what I told you, but it works phenomenal. Are you billing extra for it? Yes. What are you billing for the laser then? Um, <laughs> I can't remember. Okay, I think the code, don't quote me, look it up. Yeah. Under 20 centimeters, I think it's 97657. So the first one is an office visit with it, and then it's wound care. And you're allowed wound care. The modality, it says, by any means. Oh, not the right. The Medicare one, like, like, thirty-two, thirty-six dollars. But you know what? The first visit, you get something, you get something and you get you know, th I think it's thirty-six or twenty-six per visit. It takes me thirty seconds, and the patients feel so much better. It's goodwill. It's goodwill building for my practice. It's when I talk to them about other things that the laser can do, and it's wound care. And I, I, I don't feel I charge for many things. I don't feel on this I can charge them for it. I know their insurance will cover it. And there's no global period. Be very careful. The other codes have a global period. But with the new system, and there's some talk about doing away with a global period, but on this particular one, wound care, no office visit, there's no global period. You can do an office visit like every two weeks. Um, did you say that your patient, you, they felt it? Because I find when I do the wound, ca the wound healing, they, they don't feel it. They don't um, feel the, the first pass. They, they don't feel it at all. Oh. But I on, there was only one patient with darker skin that I did. Sorry, can you hear me? Go ahead. There's just one patient with darker skin that 
that did feel it a bit, so I had to back off. I think if you're doing it on the foot, they're not going to feel it. You know, that's so thick, right. you're not going to feel it. But when you're doing a tear, a skin tear, they're going to feel it on the second or third pass on the elderly patients. They also don't have a tolerance. Mm. Dr. Sherrata Rosenberg is correct because uh, um, the goodwill and uh, giving people extra is, is what differentiates. Uh, is that, you know, we're on the, the leading edge of technology here, which sets us up in a niche apart. And uh, there's an old saying in New York uh, uh, about the stock market, bulls make money, bears make money, and pigs get slaughtered. So uh, don't, don't be a pig, okay? If you're gonna, if you're gonna, do, some, you're gonna do something good for people, That's true. do it, uh, you know, damn the torpedoes. We make enough money on other things. So, so that's, a, that's an aside. Um, where are we doing our time? We're done? Okay. I'm, I'm being pulled off the stage. Thanks very much for being an attentive audience. I appreciate the time.